Hi, Hello PhD listeners. This week, we wanted to share an episode from October 2019, where we talked to Jimena Jadice, an associate professor of cell biology and physiology at the University of North Carolina. If Dr. Jadice's name sounds familiar, it's because she was the thesis advisor of Dr. Emma Hinkle, who was a recent guest on our show for episodes 191 and 192, where Emma discussed lessons learned during graduate school and her life as a medical writer. Since Emma discussed her experience in grad school and in the lab in great detail, we thought it'd be interesting to revisit the fascinating discussion we had with her advisor, Dr. Jadice, three and a half years ago. We often say that there are many roads that can lead to a PhD, but I guarantee that you have not heard about a career path like this before. From life as a nun to a tenure-track faculty member in cell biology, this is a story you don't want to miss. This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. I think that was the first time they saw a nun in their real life, not in a movie or in a cartoon. Everything that I learned in that period and everything that I developed during those years now is really paying off. Welcome to Hello PhD podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we hear from a scientist who landed a faculty job, but took a unique path to her training. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 122. I'm Joshua Hall. <laughs> and I'm Daniel Arneman. <laughs> and we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Josh, what is better than two turntables and a microphone? One microphone, no headphones, and we're going to have to share it. Um, so we went to Madison, which everybody heard the episode a couple of weeks ago, and we packed up all the recording equipment, and it's still somewhere else. Yeah, we have our mobile recording device, and because we knew we were doing the interview with Julia, we packed some extra microphones and all of our headphones, and they are in a bag in my office and not here. So we are down one microphone and all headphones. So we are passing this microphone back and forth like the old days. If we were feeling more bold, we could just set it between us and put our faces together. But probably this is better. So bear with us. Hopefully this will turn out all right. And uh, let's get on with the ethanol section of the show. All right, Dan, I was feeling really thirsty tonight for some reason. I think I had a really salty dinner and the beer I had to choose from was like a chocolate hazelnut porter. And, and that just felt too heavy for, for this time of year and, and how thirsty I felt. And then the listeners who've been listening for a while enough to know what our beer tastes are might be surprised by this. But I picked out the Destill Brewery Wild Sour series, Here Goes Nothing Ghosts. I'm just laughing because it says, Here Goes Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't even say it with the, the emphasis on the correct syllable. Here. It is. Uh, I don't know how this is going to treat you if you had a salty dinner, because this is a very salty beer. Yeah, I think we learned that last time we had a, had a ghost on the show, that part of where the name comes from is the Goslar River, I believe, that is a, a brackish body of water. So most ghosts have salt added to them. And this one actually says, brewed with coriander and sea salt. Dan, since you don't have a microphone right now, I'm going to go ahead and just tell you what I think about it. You know, this one's interesting to me because I think most sours that I've had, or at least we've had on the show, they're really doctored up with some other flavors, like some other type of fruit or other types of spices. This is very, it's certainly sour, but it's very crisp and clean. And to me, this is almost what I would imagine as almost an index case of a ghost of beer. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with that. I don't get a lot of other fruity flavors or vegetal flavors. It really seems like a... a a sour, salty beer. So yeah, I think it's probably a good baseline for understanding what the variety is like. Do you like it? Of course I like it. I'm I'm happy to try anything new. And it doesn't have any weird off flavors or compounds that are distracting. So it is not it's not something you typically would experience if you were drinking um beer at the bar, but I think it's it's worth trying for people who haven't tried it yet. I'm not gonna go so far as to say I like sour beers now, but I think this is moving me in that direction. I, I can tolerate this. It's not bad. And look how much I've drank so far. I mean, for me, 
it's the thirst. It's very thirsty and it's very cold. Uh, but anyway, Dan, I wanted to talk about some things that I am definitely a fan of. The first one is a new Apple podcast review that we got. This one came from PhD Warrior and five star review. And PhD Warrior said, I can't say enough about this podcast. It's really helping me as I write my dissertation. I'm interested in knowing how it's helping write a dissertation. I have a feeling it'd be very distracting if you're trying to write a dissertation. But we're happy to have you on board, PhD Warrior. And thank you for leaving a review. Anybody else out there who has the time, please do leave us a review. It helps people find the show. I think that's how uh, Apple Podcasts does some of their rankings and some of their discovery. So if you have a second, go leave us a star rating. Um, We also want to thank our Patreon patrons, the new ones... Grace and Kyle, thank you so much for your support. Yes, thank you, Grace and Kyle, and we'll see you on the Slack channel. So, Dan, our listeners who've been around a while might remember about a year ago, our friends at Promega sponsored an art contest specifically for our listeners, and they wanted to do it again. So this year, they are sponsoring the second Promega art contest for creative scientists for Hello PhD listeners. And what you can do is submit a digital image of your artwork by December 1st, 2019. And this is broadly defined. This could be a photograph, a microscopy image, a painting, a sculpture, a drawing, really any media that shows off your creativity. And three winners will receive a prize pack and also be featured in the Promega Art Showcase starting in January 2020. And one grand prize winner, Dan, will have the chance to do what we did, and that is hang out in Madison, Wisconsin, check out Promega headquarters, meet some of the R&D scientists, and also attend the opening of the art show at Promega in January. So if that's something you're interested in, you can go to promega.com slash hellophd to enter. Winners will be announced on December 6th. So it is October now, so go ahead and get those entries in or be thinking about what you'd like to submit, if that sounds interesting to you. And the winner last year, uh, we're going to try to get on the show so we can ask her about winning and about her trip to Madison. So uh, we're going to be reaching out to Aparna, who won last year's contest. Uh, We had a great time in Madison. I'm anxious to hear how she did. All right, Dan. You know, last week's episode, we got a lot of great feedback from people who enjoyed hearing Julia's very unique path into the PhD and now into her career. I think we've somehow stumbled upon a little mini theme <laughs> with continuing with this episode. We are talking to Jimena Judice, who is a faculty member at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And Dan, I would say she has also had a fairly unique and non-traditional path to become a PI. Yeah, Josh, we, we all the time we talk about non-traditional, quote unquote, uh, career paths, people who go on to do science writing and they go on to work in industry and business and different things. What's so interesting about Jimena is she ended up in a very tradi- what we consider a traditional career. That she has a faculty position, but absolutely her path there was not one I had ever heard before. Yeah, absolutely. And I became interested in talking to her because being at UNC, I've known Jimena for quite a while. She's been a mentor of some of the students in my program. So I've known her actually for a few years now, and she was sitting on a panel, a career panel, probably two or three months ago, and the panelists were just talking about their career path and their life leading up to uh, becoming whatever their their current job was. And I got to admit, Dan, I was half paying attention. (laughs) I was drinking my coffee, probably looking at my Twitter feed, and all of a sudden, Jimena mentioned that she had been a nun prior to becoming a faculty member. And so I spit my coffee out on the table. That didn't really do that. But I thought, well, there's something you don't hear every day. That would be an interesting person to talk to on the show. And and you, when you say none, you mean like lived in a convent. Yeah, Josh, this is not a career path that I would have expected anybody to go through because typically you would uh, live in a convent probably for the rest of your life. And so I'm really anxious to hear First of all, how she made the decision to become a nun, but then also how she made the decision to leave that life behind and to uh, pursue a, a research career. So let's go straight to the interview. My name is Jimena Shulise. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Physiology at UNC Chapel Hill. I started my lab in on March 2016. I am originally from Argentina, where I did my PhD. 
and my undergrad. And then I came here to do my postdoc in Baylor in Houston. And in 2016, I came here to start my lab. And now you're a faculty member. Yeah. <laughs> Living the dream, right? Living the dream. <laughs> Making the dream real. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So why don't we start kind of at the beginning? So as much as you can remember, when did you first become interested in science? Well, I think my story is different than other stories. I think I didn't know that science exists as something you can do for your life and as a career. My my family is, is full of architects. My parents are architects. My sister is an architect. My cousins are architects. Oh. Uncles are architects or graphical designers. So I really didn't have anyone close that can... I mean, that I could imagine that you can do some type of science as a career. So in the beginning, I chose to study engineering and maybe because it's somehow related with architecture. So that's what I started studying when uh, I finished high school. I, I did industrial engineering. So it's very like close to economics and how to manage companies. And then I think that now that I am running my lab, a lot of things that I learned from that period is helping me now in how to manage like a small group of people and small team with similar goals. So I think, yeah, when I hear like as science as a potential career, it was like when probably I was around 25 years old. So after you were finished with undergrad... Well, so let's organize oh, okay. <laughs> my life. <laughs> so I was studying engineering. I studied engineering for four years in Argentina. Our like undergrad degree are six years in general. Uh, and they are much more specific. Uh, so when you do engineering, it's engineering. When you do chemistry, it's chemistry. So when I was uh, finishing my fourth year, I I changed my path. And that's when I started considering being a nun. So I entered a congregation when I was 21 years old. So I left the university when I had just one or one year and a half more to receive my degree in engineering. Oh, wow. So you were four years into your degree and mm -hmm. you were getting close to the end. Yeah. And then you, then you decided, this is not what I want to do. Well, I think it's not that I said this is not what I want. I want what I want to do. I think I felt that this was more like a, that was my profession, and I was deciding some, something more at the personal level. So I put that on hold because maybe later I could finish, even being an nun. So I put it on hold, and I started like in the like the religious life, um, and as part of that, I mean. In the fourth year in the religious life, we have some time to a couple of years to do a, something that could be related with with the mission of the congregation to study a career or to get an undergrad degree. And that's when I started thinking what I wanted to do. Like after three years in the congregation, being part of the congregation, I said, okay, what do I want to study? as a nun, then I can use it and that then I can develop that as part also of my religious life. And I was in a congregation that was very educational focused. So that's when I thought, okay, maybe something that I can use to teach and to promote education through that topic. And I think that's when I, I discovered that you can study mathematics or like chemistry or biology and that there were people doing that, and I didn't really know that that exists. Uh, for me, it was, okay, I know engineering, I know you can be a medical doctor, but that you can study math. So you, didn't, you weren't necessarily aware of that, even at the beginning when you were first going through your undergraduate no, training, that that was all. an option? No, I you didn't were. know that exists, but I felt that I, I enjoyed that. I remember when I was when I started looking into the potential programs and universities, I went to the university where we study chemistry or biology or math, physics, that is the same university. So and I remember like the first image that I have in my head is seeing students with the white lab coats and the labs they have like glass windows and walls. 
And I have that image in my mind. Like I said, that's what I want. I want to do that. I want to be with a white lab coat doing these things that they were doing that I didn't know what that was. Mixing things and doing experiments, right? So in that moment, I thought it that like more like, okay, I can teach this in schools, like being a nun. But I feel that I always had the, the dream of the research, like the doing experiments, although I always like education and teaching. So I, I think that's when I thought for the first time, like science as something you can study and you can work for that and you can have a career on that. But that was not in my spectrum. So was there a standard when you pursued the religious path and became a nun? Is there a set commitment that you have for a certain amount of time? Because obviously you mentioned after a certain number of years, you had the opportunity to go back to school and to pursue some other things and you discovered science. So once you discovered that interest in science and math and these other things, was it easy to then make that transition and follow that path? Was that a challenging decision? Because it seemed like that could represent a different change in direction. I think in several aspects, it was challenging. So first of all, in the religious path, you live in a congregation. So you leave your family and you live in a convent or in a community with other nuns. And that's where you live. That's your home. And you also work during the day. And since my congregation was like very educational focused, I was mostly teaching at different levels, like primary school, kindergarten, secondary school, people in the street, rural schools. So I was like full time working and teaching and doing all these things. So usually and we had like just three years to do undergrad whatever we decide to do that somehow align with the mission of the congregation. So the degree of chemistry that is the, the, the undergrad that I did was six years. So I was like under the problem, okay, how can I fit six years in three? So I asked for a lot of like equivalent credits from engineering. So in that way, I could like reduce some years. I also, some of the courses, I, I just study by myself and then go and do the exam. And then I really tried to take as many courses as I could in the shortest period period of time. And the undergrad in Argentina is very different. It's not like here that when you're in college, you live in the college and you are full-time dedicated to to study. In general, in, in Argentina, at least in my university, that is a public university, a lot of the students work at the same time that we study. So you have the opportunity to go to classes in the night. So like between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. So I did the majority of my classes in that time so that I could like work during the day in what I was doing. And then I went back to the to my community that was like one hour and a half from where the university was. So I think like in the practical things it was challenging because i was i had to multitask a lot of things uh, but in general my philosophy was like when i am in the classes i am in the classes and i have to try to get as much as i can from here because i don't have so much time to study at home and i really did that i mean chemistry is very intense and each class is like 20 hours per week so each course so it was challenging in that aspect. So that's the practical aspect. I think then there was like challenges also in terms of, okay, how do you align religious with science? Uh, and especially in a university that was very against religious. So your experience, and just to set the context, you know, a little bit. So the path you were taking was unique in the context of the other students who you were studying with. No, that for sure. I think that that was the first time they saw a nun in their real life, not in a movie or in a cartoon, <laughs> because I was dressing as a nun. In oh, that so you were representing yourself as a nun. You were yeah, representing yeah, your yeah. congregation and your community yes, at yes. the university. Yeah, and I always remember the first day I went to the university, I entered the class, and everybody just turned to see who was that cartoon moving <laughs> into the class and that was me and uh, in science classes yes. no doubt yeah yeah so i think that was another challenging more like in terms of like the university perspective i think 
I think it was the first time that a nun was in that uh, university, like in terms of like science degrees. And I think people in the beginning were like, I, I always feel that in general people assume that I thought in certain way or that my uh, my ideas were certain ideas. And I think that it took them time to know me as a person, not like as a representation of a, an institution, right? And then I made like really nice relationships with other students, with professors, with faculty, and till now I keep all those relationships that are not just professors now are friends or like other students of course are also friends but I think it was nice for me to give myself the opportunity okay people can think that I am certain way just because of the color that I am using or my clothes or their previous ideas of the catholic church and then based on what they knew about me they could have a different opinion right but I think that was the second challenge. And then probably the third one is inside the Catholic Church, how to combine the Catholic principles with science. But I think that internally, for me, that was easier because for me, we were both completely compatible. And I still feel that the same way. But yeah, I think those were the three challenging things, I would say. Well, that, that was a question I had was, so when you entered the university, was the expectation that you would then bring the knowledge and skills that you learned in university back to your community, back to your congregation? Or at that point, was it acceptable for you to leave this position as a nun and go explore other career opportunities? Or what was the expectation there when you left to go study I science? Think I think when you choose the religious path, it's like it's more a, a personal decision. It's like when you get married with someone, then you have your profession or your career that are somehow independent, but they are not that independent, right? In the religious path, is somehow similar. They are independent, but they are not that independent, right? So I think that mostly was, okay, let's have a degree so that that allows you to work and function in the society. So... I was teaching chemistry for several years, being a nun, uh, or science, or things related with what I was studying and then with my degree. Uh, I think that when I decided to leave the congregation was more at my personal level of thinking, okay, I feel that there are things that I really love of this life, but there are also things that I feel like I still feel that is not my fit. And that's completely independent of my professional aspects. So while in the congregation, I think that I could like develop my my passion for science more in the educational aspect. Okay, teaching these things and and motivate young kids for science. And for me, that was super. I really enjoy that. I mean, in the classroom mostly. Then when I decided to leave the congregation, more with a personal decision, that's when I started. I kept teaching. In, in primary schools, secondary schools, even the same school where I was in the congregation for several years. And that's when I decided, okay, well, the next step in science after you get, like, I, I, I had an equivalent of a master degree, is like a PhD. So I just went into that, like, and I was teaching in schools, and then I started my PhD. Was this at the same university you had yes. been attending? Okay. Yeah, so they saw all the process, so they saw me, like, as a nun, then they saw me leaving the congregation, so somehow, I mean, I feel like my university was part of my family, and they, they, they saw all my process as well. Were you doing research during that time as an undergraduate, or when did you first get into the lab? I know you saw that view of the students in the lab coats. When did you first get to experience being that student? So being that student since the beginning, because in my university, you start being in the lab since the first class. You The classes are theory, and the, but the majority of the classes are in the labs. So as a student, since the beginning. And then Still being a nun, I started like volunteering in a lab as an undergrad, doing research, studying like genetics variants of a disease. And that was 
as a nun. And for me, that was also super nice because I think it was also good for the for my community to see, okay, it's not just teaching. You can also do research. And that's how I discover, like, okay, I really like to do research. I really like to do experiments, not like in a class setting, more like in a real life setting. Yeah, and for me, it was great that I think a lot of people like in the university, probably, I don't know if they will give you a spot as a nun in a lab. So I think there were people that trust on me and say, I want to give her the opportunity. And I, I remember two people doing that. I always remember them and I am still in contact with them. Well, and, you, and you had been able to allow them to get to know you and change any preconceived notions mm-hmm. they might have or any biases or limitations yeah. they might have placed on you before they met you. you. They knew who you were. Yeah. And like that, I had like several stories in the university of like that type of conversations with people like magic conversations uh, that I will always like remember for my entire life. So then you transitioned into working into your PhD work. And so what were what were those years like? Well, they were also intense because another thing that is different in Argentina than here, or at least it was different before. Now I think things are changing. In Argentina, especially for academia, we had limitations in terms of the age. So you had a limit to get a predoctoral fellowship in terms of age, a limit to get a postdoctoral fellowship in terms of age, and a limit to get a PI position in terms of age. So do you mean once you're a certain age, you're too old and they won't let you? You are not eligible wow. anymore. Okay. I think that's changing now, like probably the last four years there was a change. But while I was there, I was always like in the limit because since I was like 10 years as a nun, I had like a shift in 10 years. So that's why I did my undergrad instead of six years in like four years. And then I had to do my PhD in three years and a half instead of five years that is in Argentina. Because, and my postdoc as well, because I was planning to return to Argentina. But if I wanted to return, I had to be younger than certain age. So you had a very real deadline hanging over your head. Yes. And I applied to my predoctoral fellowship in the limit. So if I didn't get it, I couldn't reapply because I would have not been eligible anymore. So that was certainly a motivator, I would guess. Yeah, both things, like a motivator and a huge pressure. But somehow I think I I always face that as, okay, that's how it is, and let's make this to work. And also in Argentina, I mean, it's different than here. Usually if you want to do a PhD or or a postdoc, you have to have your fellowship because there are no grants that can support students or postdocs yeah so I went and I applied for my fellowship I got it and that's how I started my PhD in Argentina and it was mostly in chemistry organic chemistry and that's when I started like transitioning into more biological questions but always from a chemistry perspective so I did my PhD it was more like yes three years and a half in the same university, the University of Buenos Aires. And during that period, I was like six months in Germany, learning like microscopy in the Max Planck in Göttingen. And for me, that was a great opportunity. I'm just curious, when you were in graduate school, was your advisor one of these really supportive people at the university that you had met as an undergraduate who was was that a really supportive relationship? Did that mentorship be, and you felt during undergrad, did you have a great graduate experience as well? I think I learned a lot from my experience in grad school. I was in a very big lab, a lab that was in two floors. So sometimes I didn't see my PI for like two, three months. I didn't even know if she was there or not. I mean, she was a very busy person traveling all over the world. And I think... During that time, I developed a lot of independence, a lot of like resilience, and probably a lot of what I want, of what I think is important in mentorship, probably because I didn't have like the closest mentorship that now I know that is possible. In that moment, I didn't know. I mean, it was my only experience or my second experience, but the first one like full time. 
research experience. So I think I learned to be independent, to generate ideas, also to ask for help from other people. Like I feel like I during that mo during my PhD I built a, a very strong network of mentors independently of my PI and those mentors are still close to me and that they are still supporting me but that also influenced when I was looking for postdoc positions I really wanted to be in a not a huge lab I wanted to be in a medium lab like 10 15 people and try to make sure that my mentor can mentor the number of people that he or she has. And I remember the conversation with my mentor before joining his lab. And he told me something that I still remember. He said, 10 to 12 is the number of trainees that I can mentor by myself. And I think in that moment, I didn't understand what he was talking about. But I think now I understand much more. Now that you have your own lab. Yeah. I think after my PhD or during my PhD, I learned which things maybe I have to think what is the best for me. Because I feel that I needed to learn how to be a mentor by being mentored. Mm -hmm. And I think I received that more in my postdoc. Mm -hmm. In my PhD, I probably received more like, a, or I learned more like how to be independent, how to build a network of people. How, And I had good opportunities. I mean, the opportunity to go to Germany and to learn in a, in a very important institution. And for me, it was great. And I appreciate that. So then tell me a little bit about what was that experience when you left Argentina to go to Texas, to Baylor, and do a postdoc there? It seems like that would represent a fairly significant life change at that point in time. What was that whole transition into your postdoc to a new university, a new country, and a new lab? What was that experience like? Well, the truth is that I was about to go to Italy to do my postdoc with this, man, this person in Italy. And he was super generous and saying, you know, you should have an experience in the U.S. And Tom, my, my mentor in Baylor, this person in Italy, he said, he's a good person and he's a good mentor and he's a good scientist. So I feel that, that the person in Italy was super uh, generous with me to think on what was best for me, not what was best for him. So that's how I ended in, in Baylor. But I was in between going to Italy with the person I knew more or going to Baylor. So I decided to go to Baylor. And so in both cases, it would have been a transition. Argentina, Italy, Argentina, the U.S. So it was a huge change. I think it's not just the language. I think it's the culture. It's also the scientific system. I think also like the scientific system in, in Europe is more similar to our system in Argentina. So the U.S. system is very unique, and I was not used to that. Uh, so I had to learn how to think in this system. I think that in Argentina and Europe, we are more like hypothesis driven in the sense that it's not that you can explore 10 million of hypotheses. You have to set up your hypothesis and that's what you will address. And you will not test like 10 million of antibodies. You have to do your research and pick the best one and then make it work. Somehow here is different. I think that probably because you have more resources, but also because the competition and the pressure is higher. So you have to try different things at the same time so that something works. And I was not used to that. I was very used to think a lot before doing anything. And in that aspect, I think that Tom was a great mentor to me to make that transition, waiting my times, but at the same time pushing me, okay, now stop thinking, just do it, and then we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, that was a completely different way of like thinking, behaving, doing stuff. I mean, I had to change my personality. But now I feel I am like a combination of both styles. Well, that was the question I had. Now that you have your own students and you run your own lab, your scientific identity was initially formed in Argentina with those experiences, but then you had this postdoctoral training right before you started your lab. So yeah, who are you now as a mentor, as a scientist, and the way you train your students? So you say you're somewhat of a combination of both ways mm -hmm. of thinking. Yeah, I think I am like the product of my entire life. And I think it's 
like the good experience I have during my postdoc in terms of like changing my way of doing science, like learning a new way that complement the previous way. Then I learned how to be a mentor here, at least in the U.S. But I also think that my style, I see things from my religious path also. Like I think I learned there how to, well, all the part about teaching and education, I think is coming from that stage. Also how to manage people. Like when I was in the congregation, I was handling the entire economy of school and all the personnel, all the students, all the parents, fellowships and everything related with the entire school. So somehow I think that prepared me a lot to I mean, that's what I'm lots doing of, now. That's lots of management and organizational yeah. skills that I would argue most faculty, at least here in the U.S., who have gone the traditional route never have the opportunity no. to gain those skills yeah. that are needed to run a lab. Yeah, I, uh, many times I thought, okay, well, I am 10 years behind the majority of the faculty because I was 10 years in an, but now I feel like everything that I learned in that period and everything that I developed during those years now is really paying off in, in more human aspects and managing aspects and well, of course, the educational part as well. But I didn't expect that. I think it was like a plus. It was like a gift to me to realize that the last three years. It's like, I think it's the first time I see that everything that was part of my life in, in the past has a place now, a, a good place, right? A, a beneficial place, including all those years that maybe you think, okay, they are completely unrelated with what I'm doing now. I don't know. I think it's, they are very related, honestly. And then I think that from my education in Argentina, I think all the independence, the resilience, all the potential of doing like million things with something super tiny, I have that with me. And I think that's for me, is again, a gift. Because, you know, in Argentina, we don't have so many resources. So you are used to do magic with the little things you have. Well, and probably be extremely thoughtful yeah. when you're making decisions about what experiments mm -hmm. to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always think, I always tell my people in the lab, I mean, every single experiment needs to give us something. And has the potential to, be for a pub to go for a publication or for presentations or for talks. So that changed the way you do your experiments and your how you drive your project. It's not like things in the air, like to try 10 million of things so that one work. I am very used to try to make everything to work, mm -hmm. right? So I try to balance those two things. Well, I'm really fascinated by things you were saying about the time you spent as a nun and how a lot of those skills and experiences really are benefiting you now. Mm-hmm. So you say you recommend all students become a nun before <laughs> grad school? No, no, no. <laughs> no. I think that each person has to follow their own path. Mm -hmm. But I always, and that's something I always say to people, especially when people decide things that are not that linear way. I always tell them, I mean, you know, life is not linear. I mean, there are people, they have a linear life and that's fine. But it's not the end of the world when your life is not linear. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you realize the value of certain things that you feel that are outside of the line later in time. So nothing is a waste. Uh, everything has a place in your life. Because sometimes I think academia is presented as a very linear thing. And if you don't follow the line, you feel that you don't have a space. I felt that. Honestly, I felt it like many, many times. Okay, I will be out of my age for the fellowships or for the faculty position, or I am not coming from the traditional mm -hmm. universities in the U.S., so I will not have a faculty position in the U.S. And, you know, I mean, even with a life that is completely not linear, because my life is not linear at all, I have my love. I had fellowships my entire training. I ha I'm having my grants now. I'm getting publications. So I said, okay, I mean, you can have all that with a linear life, but you can also have it with a non-linear life. There, there are many ways to accomplish yeah. to make it to this point. Yeah. So, so that was actually one, I guess, somewhat last thing I wanted to ask about. So you mentioned a little while ago that initially you really thought you were going to go back to Argentina and do science there. But obviously that's not what you've done so far. You have a faculty position here in the States. 
When did you decide that that's what you wanted to pursue and apply for faculty positions? I think I didn't decide. I think that when I was in my third year of my postdoc, I started thinking, okay, well, now I, not now, but maybe in a year or two, I will need to start applying for the next step. And I said, okay, let's practice this fall. And I just submitted a few applications here in the U.S., a few in Europe, and a few in Argentina. And I For practice? To practice, because I was very, like, baby in that moment. Like, three years of postdoc in the U.S. is, is a short postdoc. But for me, it was more like, okay, let's practice so that next year I made all the mistakes and I can do well applying to a ton of places, because that's what they tell you. So I had offers in my practice <laughs> and they were good offers so i just what did said, you think when you got a, an offer back and then another offer back what were you thinking uh, i don't know I, I i think i didn't i was very surprised i think it's sometimes i feel like it, probably in in many aspects in my life sometimes i feel like like a kindergarten kid that you put in the university and you tell him or her, okay, now do your stuff in the university and the kindergarten kid doesn't know what the hell mm. is the university. So I felt somehow like that in that process saying, okay, now I have two options or I pick, well, three, or I pick one of these options or I just decline them, and next year I apply to more places. So did you really think, I'm not ready for this? Like, was that going through your mind when you were thinking about declining these? No, I think I thought that when I accepted the position and I was <laughs> moving here, and I said, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, I said, I mean, and especially when I met other junior faculty and I and I and I realized, okay, they did like five years of postdoc, five years of PhD. And then I started counting. I have like almost half of the time of training of all of them. And I started feeling, okay, I think I'm not prepared for this. But in that aspect, it was great UNC because I mean, UNC has a very strong like support for junior faculty and a strong mentoring program for us. So especially for me that I came with short PhD, short postdoc, that was great. I mean, it gave me a lot of self-confidence and also support from other faculty, established people with experience. And I also felt like, I mean, here, I feel like people want you to succeed. For me, that was very important because I really felt, okay, I don't know how to do this job. I mean, I know how to do experiments. I know how to probably how to publish papers under the responsibility of someone else. Mm -hmm. I know how to get fellowships because I got fellowships always. But a different story is to run your lab. And now it's like all these people will depend on your grants. So it's not the fellowship for you. It's like the grant for everybody in the lab, their careers, their thesis. That's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And I think that we are not trained for that. I mean, nobody prepares you for that. You are prepared based on your own experience. And then you just learn while you are doing the things. <laughs> but I mean, so far, it seems that it's working <laughs> more or less okay. It is. You have the grants, your students are doing well, yeah. And, and yeah, you're doing it. Yeah. So to, to wrap this up, thinking back over your life and the things that you've learned, and now obviously you pass along a lot of these lessons and advice to your trainees and to your students in your lab, but we have a lot of other trainees who are probably listening to you tell your story now. So what advice would you give to them. Maybe they're just starting out in research as an undergraduate or they're trying to go through graduate school and think about their career. Just what advice would you give to trainees going through the process now? I mean, I think several things I would say. The first thing is follow your heart. I think I always follow my heart. And if you have something you want to do and you have that passion, just don't be afraid of, okay, I don't know how to do it, or there is no space for me, or it's too difficult, or there are a lot of competition, or I am not good enough. If that's what you want to do, just do your best, and probably you will be able to make it. So that's the first thing I always tell my people in my lab, but also other people across campus, when sometimes they ask me, okay, but in academia there is no place for everybody, or the competition, or is... I said... If that's what you want to do, just do your best, follow your heart, and you will make it. 
And when I say academia, that applies to whatever you decide to do in your career. I think the second thing I would say is like, I really enjoy my job. I really love doing science. I really feel like happy in every day. So it's true that the competition, the pressure and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, do I feel happy? Am, am I doing what I like to do? Honestly, I feel happy. I feel a happy person. I mean, I have moments of stress, but I don't feel like my life is like under permanent stress. So it's possible to do science in a normal setting and have your life and be a happy person in your job. I think it's possible. I feel happy. Then probably one is what I said before, just value your life as it is. If it is linear, it's linear, it's great. If it is non-linear, it's non-linear. It, it's great also. And then probably the last one is mentors are super important, are important in practical things. But I think the most important part of the mentors is that they can support you and they can make you a happy person uh, in science. At least that's my experience with my mentors. It's like, I think I am a happy person in science, mostly because I feel that I have the mentors that support me, the mentors that I admire, the mentors that trust on me. And that I think at the end, make me a happy person. So try to have as many mentors as you can. And you will have mentors that are your PIs, mentors that are uh, in your committees, mentors that are somewhere else in the world that are just supporting you and that they are trusting on you and they want the best for you. I'm also trying to learn from them. I want to be like them. I want to be a person that can uh, have that meaning for other people because they were so important to me that I hope at some point of my life I can do something at least a little similar to what they did to me. All right, Dan, that was a pretty fascinating story, huh? Well, I agree with her that life isn't linear. And I think we heard that last week when we talked to Julia, that sometimes you are not making the plan about how your research career is going to go or how your life is going to go. And I think what we're seeing is with these women who have been very successful, even though life has not been what they predicted, they adapt, they change, they, they take what happens and they turn it into something that benefits their career. I really am fascinated by the way that she took those experiences and she used them later on. So she talked about how those first 10 years of managing a budget in in the uh, parish and managing people and managing projects that were, those things were actually helping her in her scientific career in ways that scientists who had gone straight through grad school, straight through a postdoc and into a faculty position, they had never had that experience. I thought that was really fascinating. I totally agree, Dan. And, and no matter what path you take, you're always learning something that may be useful in ways you don't always imagine. And I think we've always talked about that from the point of view of students who go through graduate school and then go do something else outside of academia. And we talk about how those things they learned in grad school are helpful. Um, but here, you know, there's a story that actually is common for, for a lot of people who are non-traditional students that go back at a later age after they've maybe had a different career or done some other things. Those skills that they learned, that's not wasted time. But in fact, they may have a leg up in certain ways by the experiences that they've had in the years before they transition into science, whether that was as a nurse, as a teacher, or even as a nun. Along those lines, one thing that really stood out to me in her telling her story is the resourcefulness that she's had. I think so many times for many of us, and I think this was true, true for me, coming through the system in universities in the United States that were very well resourced, I think there's a certain way of thinking that develops if you've been in those environments where, you know, really funding has been pretty good and you buy what you need. And if something doesn't work out, oh, you just buy some more. Um, and I think there's a little bit of creativity maybe that's lost or at least a little bit of complacency maybe that can, can lead from that. And one thing that was really evident in her telling her story, but also just in knowing her is how resourceful she is, not just herself, but the way she mentors her students. I know they're applying for all the fellowships. They're being very creative in the way they design their experiments and very thorough. And I think that has to be driven by the experiences that she had. And I had never thought about the idea that 
if you come from a lab that does have a lot of resources, you are attempting four or five different things at once and not really thinking through them in advance. And, and that was totally my experience. Most of the time that wouldn't work out, but I guess it didn't matter because we had more money to go buy more reagents. I felt a little bit challenged. What would my training have been like if I had much more limited resources? I could only do the experiment once. Would I have actually had better results if I had slowed down and done that work? I thought that was a, a, a challenging statement. I think it's something that we should think about as we think about scientific training. Is it better to have infinite funds or is it better to have that limit on the system so that you slow down and try to actually think through your work? Yeah, I think about that a lot, Dan, the more time that goes by. I think we also have this culture of busyness. And, you know, sometimes I worry that we're spending a lot more time doing than we are actually thinking. And you could you could be right, Dan, if we just slowed down a little bit and spent a little more time being thoughtful. I mean, did you ever feel this way that almost like if you weren't up at your bench doing experiments, you were somehow slacking off or wasting time when really it would have been really hard to allow myself, I think, to say, you know what, the first hour of every day or at least a few hours in one afternoon, I'm just going to go to the library or a quiet place and just sit and think, maybe write out some ideas. I don't think I hardly ever allowed myself to do that. How about you? Oh, absolutely not. And and it occurs to me, I think better when I'm walking. If I had taken a walk with a notepad, I probably would have gotten a lot more done. But you could never leave the lab like that. It's just, it's not possible to, to be seen wandering around the courtyard with your sketch pad thinking of ideas. You've got to keep busy. Josh, I want to, I want to bring up what she said about how happy she is doing science, being in the job she's in, because she certainly faced a lot of challenges getting there. And I think at a lot of different stages, it would have been really expedient and easier if she said, well, you know, I'm starting this too late. I probably shouldn't start this. Or I'm about to run out of funding because I'm too old to get these grants. Or, you know, how am I going to get to the United States to do this postdoc that I want to do? I don't have money to go to this conference. Whatever the, the challenges were. And, and she kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And she got there. And she's so happy. And I, I just want to stop and reflect on the fact that that was hard work, but it was work motivated by her passion. It wasn't the default thing that, that she would do in her life because that's what everybody in her life had done before her. It was something that she cared so much about and loved so much that pushed her to the, to the next step and the next step. And now she's, she's doing what she loves. Yeah. And I loved when she talked about that at the end and what it, immediately took me back to was what she said near the beginning of the interview as she painted this picture of walking into the university and seeing these students working in labs. And she mentioned the wearing lab coats and pipetting liquid around, mixing things together, and how she just immediately was taken by that and thought to herself, that's what I want to do. And so, you know, she had, I imagine at that time, very little idea of what that would actually be like. But to then fast forward however many years later, and she's there doing it, and she loves it just as much as she imagined she might at the beginning. It made me think about, we talk a lot, I think, on this show, and there's a lot out there in the general wisdom of academia, that faculty jobs are really few and far between, and they're really hard to get. And what this is a good reminder for me is faculty jobs are out there for the people who really want to do that. And there actually are people out there who really do want to be a PI and really do want to run a lab. And for those people, absolutely, like Jimena, absolutely, they should pursue that path. And even if you've had a very non-traditional route to get there, you can do it. You can still be very successful. The key thing is that you're passionate and that's the thing you want to do. But if it is, you know, don't let self-doubt, don't let your idea of what the career path or the limitations on you based on your own background are. If you want to do it, you can do it. I was listening to a, a podcast about a, it was an interview with a startup founder and he said something that kind of, I think applies here. He said, Somebody said, you know, why do startups fail or how do startups fail? And he said, I don't think startups fail until the the founder is done with them. And and I think it's this notion of, yes, a lot of bad things happen and almost everything goes wrong. But until you quit, until you give up on it, until you give up on your dream, 
it's still going. So, so if you really want that thing, keep going after it. Josh, the last thing that kind of struck me that I wanted to talk about was mentorship. And we talk about it all the time, and we know how important it is to find mentors, not advisors. Um, she talked about having a network of mentors, and that really supported her through times where maybe she was in a larger lab where her, her direct advisor or supervisor wasn't able to mentor her. But she said that there's like a limit on the number of people that the PI can mentor. And she, she mentioned her uh, postdoc advisor saying, I can mentor 12 people or whatever the number is. Do you think there's an actual limit? And is that something people need to be watching out for when they join a lab? Well, I think it's extremely smart and self-aware of her postdoc advisor and and now of her, I know she feels the same way, to actually know that about yourself. And that could differ from person to person. But I think that's something to ask if you're considering joining some lab. You know, maybe it's a, a medium-sized lab or even a large lab or several other grad students have joined recently. Having that conversation with the PI saying, looking for mentorship is something I would like to find in a lab to join, uh, in a thesis lab. Do you feel like you have the capacity to give me what I'm going to need. Now, part of that I think is for you as the student to really be honest with yourself about what you will need. I think it's very tempting, especially at the beginning of grad school. I think sometimes we fool ourselves and say, well, I'm not going to need any mentoring. I'm going to have an easy time of it and not need anything. But and we all need mentorship and we're going to need some of our advisors time physically and their mental energy too. And uh, I think it's a smart thing to ask, but I think it's a great sign if you encounter an advisor who has those conversations and has some idea of their own capacity as a mentor. And I'll say this, Dan, I mentioned I've worked with Jimena for several years now, and she's highly regarded as a mentor. She does a great job with her students. She's one of the most thoughtful mentors that I have known, constantly seeking feedback and wanting to get even better as a mentor. And I think that's one of the reasons she's been as successful as she has even early in her career. Well, hopefully that was helpful and, and spoke to a lot of people at a lot of different stages of their careers. I, th I think it's an inspiring story. I think it should make you want to continue on with your research and continue on with whatever you happen to be passionate about. And to accept the fact that whatever it is you think your career or your training is going to turn out like, it's not going to turn out like that. And to, to roll with it, to keep moving. With that, I will have to say thank you for sharing the microphone with me. The one major difference of this episode is that I couldn't crack jokes while you were saying something serious, which is really tough for me to sit here quietly. So uh, I apologize for every other episode where I get to do that. But hopefully next time when we come back, I will have my microphone. We'll be back to the usual wise cracking and Dan interrupting me next week. But for now, if you have a question or a topic idea, we'd love to hear it. You can email us podcast at hellophd.com, send us a tweet at hellophd, or you can leave us a message on our Facebook page. If you like the show, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love the feedback. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would appreciate the beer money. And thanks to the ongoing support from all of our patrons, especially our new patrons, Grace and Kyle. We should spend some of that patron money on a microphone and a glass case in case of emergency. <laughs> Get the microphone out. Josh, we'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>